Welcome to the Evolving Warfighter. My name is Dr. Franklin Annis. I'm very excited to have a guest with me today, a Mr. Dobber, Donald Robertson, um, a gentleman that was born in Scotland. He has 20 years experience as a psychotherapist working in London, where he also ran a training center for therapists. Uh, he moved to Canada to focus on his writing, and he's considered an expert in cognitive behavioral therapy and Greek and Roman philosophy. Uh, hopefully I captured everything there in the introduction, but is there anything else you'd like to add about your experience with behavioral health? Or I think that's about it, right? Um, my my kind of niche is, as you know, CBT and stoicism, which when I started getting into it, I was, there weren't many, there weren't many people in that niche <laughs> at one point, but it, since it's become kind of more popular now, it's become a thing since I, I, I originally got into it. I didn't, I didn't quite anticipate that. Well, that's good to hear, especially since it's expanding. Um, well, the reason why I asked you for an interview is Stoicism, I believe, has a lot of connections with the military and would be a very useful philosophy for soldiers. Uh, traditionally, it's got a long-standing tradition from the actual Stoic Marcus Aurelius going in the field as a soldier to Frederick the Great was known to carry Stoic writings with him in the battle. Uh, George Washington had a play put on for Cato why we was at Valley Forge. Um, Admiral Stockdale credited Stoicism for his survival of seven years of a POW camp in Vietnam. And then General Mad Dog Mathis, uh, the Marine general, was known to carry uh, the meditations with him for the Persian Gulf War, Afghanistan, Afghanistan and Iraq. And not knowing that he had done it, I had actually carried this copy of the meditations with me. Wow, when really? I, when I deployed to Iraq and I handed it around to quite a few of my soldiers. And I think stoicism is extremely beneficial for soldiers in the terms that it yeah. builds resistance and then it gives us a value-based decision matrix because a lot of soldiers, well, the, the best soldiers have to be able to say, like, this is an unlawful order. I'm not going to go do this because it's immoral. And... And I believe that stoicism gives all that ability to soldiers. Yeah, you, there's a lot that you've covered there already, you know, and there's the, the, the inherent value that stoicism has and why it would have that value. Um, and then there's also these interesting historical aspects to it. Um, and there's, there's this resurgence, in a way, of interest in stoicism, which I'm a member of the modern Sto stoicism organization, which is a, a multidisciplinary um, group that was set up by Professor Chris Gill at Exeter University in the UK. And so there's a bunch of other authors like William Irvin and uh, John Sellers, Jules Evans, been involved with it. And uh, so we run a conference every year. And one of the things I've often noticed, we've been doing it for about five years now, is that as stoicism has kind of grown in popularity, there are kind of subcultures, for want of a better word, the sort of subgroups that it divides into. So there's people that are into sports coaching that are into stoicism. There's kind of therapists like myself that are in it. And there's philosophers, obviously, like John Sellers, classics, classicists like Chris Gill. Um, there's people that are into kind of uh, the entrepreneurs like uh, Tim Ferriss and Ryan Holiday into that kind of self-improvement sort of stuff, more in the business world. And, uh, and then there's the military, you know, and there's this kind of subgroup of people that are connected to the military in various ways. There's Nancy Sherman's book about stoicism, um, Thomas Jarrett, who runs the Warrior Resilience Training yes, yes. Program in the military. Um, and then so that raises the question, well, what is it about stoicism that makes it of interest to these different groups? So I guess they're approaching it each from their own kind of perspective and seeing slightly different things in it. But it's such an amazing thing, you know, and it's a kind of privilege in a way to be involved with something. I, I often think that manages to bring all these different groups together. So to be at a conference where you've got a bunch of psychotherapists talking to a bunch of guys from the military, talking to some prison officers, talking to some entrepreneurs, and for them all to have something in common like a shared kind of language and, and set of values and interests it is a remarkable thing. Um, but, and it's, it makes it incredibly fertile. I mean, this is what interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary pursuits are meant to be like. You know, when they don't work, it's like everyone goes off in a different direction. But when they work, it's because we're all actually overlapping and have some kind of shared vocabulary and common ground that, that can bring us together. And then we can properly learn from each other. 
You mentioned some of the historical aspects and you talked to, you said you carried the meditations with you uh, and, and it was written uh, in a, a Roman legionary fortress in part. Like we've had these little hints. It's like the Da Vinci Code or something with Marcus. Rose. We've got these little clues, you know, and we have to kind of read between the lines a little bit. You know, that's that's what classic, classical studies is like. But he says in the rubric uh, at the start of, possibly at the end of two of the chapters, we can't even tell, uh, part was written in Carnuntum, which is right on the front line. Uh, it's the, the main Roman legionary fortress on the Danube. And the other one was written um, behind enemy lines um, across the, the Danube, and um, possibly after the the enemy had surrendered and he's kind of negotiating peace and uh, building Roman forts and things in the, in the enemy territory. But he says that's where he wrote it, at least that's where he wrote some of it. And so it shouldn't be surprising if his environment seeped into the the interests and the concepts and the language that he was using. Um, and Stoicism, you know, the founders of Stoicism didn't serve in the military, uh, but they, they always kind of had that. And, and, and some philosophers had a go at them about that, actually. I was reading just the other day, Plutarch kind of having a go at the Stoics about how they praise these things, but they don't really, the Zeno and Chrysippus didn't really get involved themselves. And that's kind of half true because some of their followers did. Um, so Stoicism, the early Stoics had a slightly more ambiguous relationship with the military. But uh, certainly once we get to the, the, the Roman Stoics, many of them were, were famous uh, military commanders. Um, Scipio Africanus uh, was a Stoic, for example, um, the Roman general that conquered Carthage. And, uh, you know, many, many, uh, many of the Romans uh, that were involved in, in military campaigns have some kind of association with Stoicism. So definitely, it's, it's very interesting subject how these two things might potentially connect together and that's before we even get into why it would be of yeah, sorry, yeah. particular use to to uh to people serving in the military today so yeah i just wanted to jump in there because kind of just express my excitement about this particular topic well it's definitely true so some of my audience might be um, novices in terms of understanding stoicism and we often think of kind of the unemotional character as a stoic. Um, could you define the difference between kind of the pop culture use of the little as stoic and then the actual real philosophy? Yeah, I think that's the easiest way to explain it is, um, and actually just as an aside, the many of these terms from Greek philosophy, as you know, have changed their meaning over time. And, and we can often say, a good example would be Epicureanism, right? So if someone says you're an Epicurean today, they mean that you like uh, hipster food and your <laughs> gastronomy and fine dining and um, expensive foods and stuff, which is almost the polar opposite of what Epicurus actually taught. So we can distinguish between capital E Epicureanism, the actual Greek philosophy, which in some ways is kind of austere, paradoxically. And the you know the modern distorted meaning of the word the lowercase e and actually the same applies to cynicism the greek philosophy to skepticism maybe even to sophistry in a sense the greek sophists were a little bit different from what we mean by sophistry today but stoicism today lowercase s uh essentially is just a personality trait for want of a better way of putting it it's having a stiff upper lip being unemotional, mental toughness, I would say that's a kind of fair appraisal of roughly what it means. But what it certainly doesn't denote when we talk about tough guys uh, and, you know, Chuck Norris a stoic or something like that, those are questions we see people asking to caricature it slightly. Um, it, that doesn't denote a Greek philosophy, right? Uh, Stoicism with a capital S is a philosophy that thrived for just under or roughly 500 years from the time when Zeno founded the school to the time when Marcus Aurelius died uh, the last famous Stoic and I've, we, we hear very little about Stoics after Marcus Aurelius because then the Christianity eventually came along prior to that Neoplatonism um, that's for about 500 years and it, it evolved we're even told at one point it fragmented into three separate branches it was a huge philosophy. There were very prolific writers. We have maybe 1% of the Stoic literature surviving today, you know? 
And it was praised in the ancient world for being such a complex and sophisticated philosophy. So it's on the, on the face of it, it's a much bigger thing, a much more complex and rounded thing than what we mean by somebody having a stiff upper lip today. But I'd actually go further than that and say that if what people mean by having a stiff upper lip is kind of just suppressing emotions, if being stoic just means kind of blocking emotions out, then in some ways that's actually in conflict with what stoic psychology teaches. And it would be important, it's an important conflict, because it's also fundamentally at odds with what modern psychotherapy, modern uh, research and psychology and psychopathology teaches us about emotional resilience and a healthy way to respond to emotions. So just kind of trying to not have emotions, trying to block them or force them out, it is generally understood to be a fairly unhealthy thing to do. And that's not what the Stoics originally meant. And in a sense, what they advocated was something slightly more subtle, slightly more complex, uh, and much healthier than that, uh, which we, you know, maybe we should elaborate, elaborate on a little bit, actually. So we'd, we, maybe this would be a good point. I'll just dive into that if you're okay. Yep, go ahead, um, go so the Stoics actually, to put it very crudely, kind of distinguish between three different types of emotion. And we could say, broadly speaking, that for the Stoics, there are good, bad, and indifferent emotions. So the bad emotions uh, are closely related to the vices. Um, and they're what the Stoics call the passions. And to cl complicate things a little bit, they, they include what we would think of as emotions, but also they include desires under that heading as well. Um, so it's always problematic to talk about emotions translated from another language. You know, we have to accept there's some problems of translation here because um, the distinctions that people make are different. They carve up the realm of emotions differently from the way that we would today. For example, the Stoics believe that anger is a form of desire. It's a desire to harm somebody, for example. Um, so desire and emotion kind of get lumped together by them. And the passions are really things that we indulge in to some extent voluntarily. We go along with them. Worrying or ruminating would be closer to what the Stoics mean by a passion. It's something that we have a little bit more responsibility for doing. And, and those are bad. They're unhealthy. They're related to vices. They're fueled by uh, irrational value judgments, for example. We're kind of doing them to ourselves in a sense. And the good news is then that we could potentially stop doing them. But there are also healthy passions that the Stoics believe in. Um, joy, feelings of pleasure that uh, we take in our own flourishing. So having pleasure in healthy things uh, and also goodwill towards other people, which is kind of a feeling or a desire. It's related to friendship or love. So wishing yourself well, wishing other people well, and even a healthy negative feeling, a kind of healthy aversion to vice, which is a little bit like what we would think of as conscience or an appropriate feeling of shame. They thought it's healthy to be of, have a feeling of aversion to doing bad things. And so there are these good feelings or healthy or rational feelings. And then there's also the indifferent ones. And these are, this is, you know, what really helps to highlight the difference with lowercase stoicism. So there are feelings that the Stoics call propathei or first movement, the first inkling, the first involuntary sign of an emotional reaction. Like uh, we might say kind of nervous arousal or fight, fight or flight response. And these are more, the Stoics say, from the body. They arise in us automatically like a reflex. Seneca compares it to somebody going to poke you in the eye and you're blinking in response to it. So he says the wise man, when he hears a sudden threatening sound, um, he's caught in the middle of a storm, for example, he'll naturally shake and turn pale. That's just, that's just human nature, right? It's just physiological. Um, and so these things, because they're involuntary, are morally indifferent to Stoics, right? They're not our fault. They're just things that happen to us physically. And crucially, the Stoics place a lot of emphasis on the fact that we should they're not, therefore not view them as bad uh, or negative or evil or even harmful, but we should very deliberately view them with studied indifference. And that means accepting them, in a sense, not struggling against them, not judging them negatively, but just kind of shrugging them off and accepting them. And the key thing is that the Stoic doesn't perpetuate them, make them worse, 
add to them or ruminate, worry about, dwell on them. So he accepts these initial involuntary feelings, which would be particularly important when someone's suffering from um, a, an anxiety disorder, for example, or, or any kind of emotional disorder, because often, you know, we know the key in modern therapy is learning to kind of forgive yourself for having these involuntary responses and accept them and not kind of add anxiety about your anxiety or guilt about your anxiety or shame about your anxiety, because that just makes things worse. So the Stoics kind of had that nailed two and a half thousand years ago. Uh, when they said these things are indifferent, they're natural and inevitable. Those are the words that they use to describe them. They think of them like the emotional reactions that animals have. Seneca said uh, uh, an animal like a, a deer or a horse uh, or cattle would be frightened by a predator, but then just return to grazing afterwards. And that's a natural emotional reaction. Um, but the majority of us today humans, we, uh, Seneca says, reason, our ability to think, is not only our greatest blessing, but it's also our greatest curse, because it allows us to perpetuate those sort of feelings, and to anticipate them happening in the future, and to ruminate about them having happened in the past, so we never let go of them, whereas the animal gets scared, but then, you know, those feelings naturally abate, and it returns to normal before long, whereas we don't allow ourselves to return to normal, and that by many modern researchers is considered to be one of the main maintaining factors in many forms of psychopathology. So we're wandering into the next question, but do you believe this forgiveness uh, really is the trait inside stoicism that allows to uh, build resilience because you basically are allowed to forgive yourself for a natural emotional response? Yeah, these things... There's a, the best example of that is in a fragment from Epictetus, which is recorded by a Roman author, a grammarian actually, uh, called Aulus Gellius. And he was caught in a storm. He tells this little anecdote about how he was caught in a storm. And there was an unnamed, famous Stoic tutor in the boat with him. It would be really cool if we could figure out who this guy was. But he was some famous Stoic teacher that was on the boat with him. And he turned white and, and became nervous, but he wasn't kind of freaking out as much as the other people on the boat. And when they got to land, Gellius said to him, I hope you don't mind me asking you this, but you're a famous stoic. Like, how come you look nervous on the boat? And the guy responded by opening his satchel and handing him one of the lost books of Epictetus. So we have four discourses, four volumes of discourses by the, the most famous Roman philosopher in a sense of all time, uh, Epictetus, certainly the most famous Stoic teacher. And, but he wrote eight volumes of discourses, or his student Arian wrote them down for him. So we only have half of them. And one of the ones we don't have, uh, Gellius read an excerpt from, and he talks about it. And this guy handed it to him. And what it says is that right from the very origins, Zeno and Chrysippus, the founders of Stoicism, said there are these natural, inevitable emotional reactions which even the perfect sage would experience in a situation like a storm. The difference is he doesn't complain about them or ruminate about them, doesn't freak out about them, doesn't exaggerate them. He doesn't apply rhetoric to them in a sense, but he accepts them and tries to view them rationally and objectively and then allows them to abate naturally. And he says like, that that's the difference between a Stoic and the majority of people. Not that the Stoic is a man of iron or stone, as they, as they put it. He's not unfeeling, which is what people mean sometimes when they use the word Stoic with a lowercase s. Jumping into the next question, um, how does the kind of the ancient philosophy of stoicism, how is that parallel with the modern concept of what cognitive behavioral therapy is? So I heard there's lots of kind of intersections there. Well, it's a, there's a lot to say about that in a way, but the short answer is the, gosh, and you know, I, I, do you know what, I'm going to say a little bit more about this because I think if I just give you the straight explanation, it doesn't highlight how damn weird this part of the story is. Right, the Stoics and the the philosophers that preceded them, really, at least as far back as Socrates, maybe beyond, the Greek philosophers thought of what they were doing as a form of therapy. 
they use the medical model to describe it, as well as using sporting and military metaphors to describe it. And they even use the word therapia, therapy, to describe what they're doing. They wrote books specifically about philosophical therapy, which are largely lost to us today. So they always thought of it as a therapy. And then it disappeared from history, largely, um, during the Dark Ages like, and what followed. And then modern psychotherapy appeared kind of gradually in the, in the 18th, 19th century, began actually with hypnotism. And then that was the kind of basis. Freud originally did hypnosis, and then he, you know, he developed psychoanalysis. And the remarkable thing is that we already had a rational psychotherapy. And, and everyone, everyone ignored it and kind of forgot about it. Apart from actually a handful of people, there was a, a guy called Paul Dubois, and he was at the time a rival of Freud, a famous Swiss psychotherapist, and he read Seneca and got his clients to read Seneca uh, and did a, a, a kind of precursor of CBT. Then Albert Ellis came along, like in the 50s, and he had been a psychoanalytic therapist, and he got completely disillusioned with it and decided to start again from scratch. And he had read Marcus Aurelius as a teenager and a bit of Epictetus, and he was inspired by Stoicism. And, you know, in a way it was inevitable, and it's kind of surprising it took so long before modern, once, you know, after the Industrial Revolution, when psychotherapy became a sort of job that doctors would do, and, you know, it became a profession gradually, it's surprising it took well, so long before people thought there already was a thing called psychotherapy like two and a half thousand years ago. And some of the ideas they had weren't really too bad. You know, I mean, I know they're old, but they're better than the ideas that Freud had. Like, you know, they're better than, they're better than saying everything's castration anxiety. Like these, these are surprisingly rash. Are you sure it wasn't the other way, Rich? Wasn't it two and a half thousand years ago that people believed all this weird stuff about dreams? No, that was, that was just a few years ago. You know, it kind of should be the other way around. Like, chronologically, it's bizarre. Well, what Freud was doing was much more sort of scientific and, you know, archaic in many respects than what the Stoics were doing. So anyway, eventually, like, guys like Ellis started to think, well, hang on a minute, these, what these guys are saying seems more common sense than what Freud was saying, and, and maybe that actually works. And they started to do it with clients. Now, Ellis had a kind of... Sort of, he he talked quite a bit about stoicism. He had kind of mixed feelings about it. Some ways he liked, in some respects, he said he liked Epicureanism better. But I would say, having reviewed his his writings, that he was more influenced by stoicism than he perhaps realized himself or or acknowledged anyway. And one of the key things was that Ellis used to teach most of his clients a quotation from Epictetus. So the, the connection was that direct, and it centers on a particular saying, which is famously from Epictetus's handbook, or Enchiridion, and it's the fifth passage. It says, it's not things that upset us, but our judgments about them. And Ellis taught that to all his clients, uh, and, which kind of makes you wonder, if he's teaching them all this quote from Stoicism, why wouldn't he delve deeper into Stoicism yep. you know, than, he, than he actually did? Um, he, he kind of dabbled in it a little bit. Now, most early cognitive therapists knew that quote as well, and many of them would give handouts to their clients, and even today still do, with that quote from Epictetus on it, uh, and teach it to the clients. It's part of what we now call the socialization, or if you like, the induction or orientation phase of therapy, where we get the client to kind of understand their role and understand the basic concepts they're going to be employing. Some people think that's the most important stage in therapy. Like is getting the client to understand the the, the they're basic. They're an active player. Yeah, that they're an active player and what it means to to be a client in therapy. And this was this quote was crucial to it. So that's that's kind of really the point of the intersection. And, and later cognitive behavioral therapists, the other weird thing about it is that most of them never read the Stoics. They all carried on qu quoting this one quote, but then kind of not reading the rest of the book, which is a really short book. <laughs> I was always puzzled by that. I speak to my colleagues and they would quote this thing. They all knew it. And I'd be like, well, so have you read the handbook? And they'd be like, well, no. I, they, you know, I just read this one quote. And be like, you should read, probably read the rest of it. The rest of it's all about therapy as well. You know, like, it's useful. But I think one of the things that uh, 
I should explain historically kind of mitigated that was that um, it wasn't long before cognitive therapy embraced evidence-based practice. Uh, in a sense, it always did. And it, I should say it wasn't long before evidence-based practice became a much more prominent aspect of the culture of psychotherapy, partly driven by, by CBT practitioners, largely driven by them. And so many modern CBT practitioners would kind of see it as a slightly at odds with the values of evidence-based practice to, to be going back and, and looking at an ancient philosophy, if that makes sense. You know, they pride themselves on, I mean, many of them would, would consider Albert Ellis ancient history, you know, and, and when they're talking about that, they would be like, that's half a century ago. We need to be looking at what the research actually says right now. That's all that really matters. And you I, know, I've seen that effect and impact inside the military where scholars will turn back and say, hey, the Stoics were on to something. And then the community will say, hey, this is so old. It's irrelevant. It's not factual base like hey it's not within the last decades so we're not going to pay attention to it well you know and funnily enough this kind of rambling of mine is 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 actually heading somewhere because i don't know how this fits into the questions that you, that you had lined up but i should say where we're heading naturally where we're going right now is to say well then what what is the point of going back to stoicism um you know maybe we should just be looking at what research says today when why would in particular would someone like me be telling psychotherapists to go back and look at stoicism <clears throat> and i think there are a number of ways that we can answer that but i think one of the best answers to that is to look at something slightly different from therapy which is particularly relevant to the military and that is therapy is remedial like it's a treatment for a problem that's already happened right what's better uh than a remedy is prevention prevention is better than cure biggest cliche in the world but you know who's going to argue with that prevention is better than cure and in the field of psychotherapy we tend to talk sometimes about stress prevention but the thing that we talk about that's a preventative version of CBT would be resilience building training. Um, and that's done in schools. It's done with people like carers. It's done with people who we expect are going to have to be doing something stressful over a long period of time, including the, the military uh, and people in, in, in certain types of jobs as well, uh, certain other types of jobs. So, I mean, we're still kind of in the early days of research on resilience training. And, and part of the reason is because we need to look at the long-term outcomes. And it, and it takes a long time to do that. You know, so if you're going to develop something which works over many years, then it takes many years to do the studies and to gather information and learn from it. So it's, it's inherently, it's like it moves like a dinosaur or something compared to short-term psychotherapy. You know, it's never going to be really a fast-moving thing. But... One of the problems with resilience building is that what researchers have found so far in schools, and I don't know if this is reflected in, the, in, in what, what's been found with the military uh, resilience training programs, but one of the things they found with school children was that resilience training based on CBT, done by Martin Seligman and people like that, is it, it seemed to work, but the effects kind of wore off because the, the students were learning psychological, psychological skills like on mass, as it were, in anticipation of having to cope with, with future stressful situations. But, you know, after a year or two, they kind of forget them or stop using them or whatever. Um, and then they, they just sort of backslide. So you'd kind of, it could work, but you'd have to kind of do regular refresher courses, which you might say is, is kind of fair enough. But then it, it, it's not as cost effective then as you would initially have hoped that it might be. Then you're like, well, how much more cost effective then is it than doing something like group therapy? Right. Like, I mean, the real holy grail would be if we could just kind of inoculate people by teaching them skills and a mindset and we didn't have to keep going back to them. Um, and I would say, and we don't have evidence to support this, so I'm kind of wary about saying it, but it's just an observation that the thing that makes stoicism problematic in the field of therapy is that it is a... Uh, that it's a philosophy, it's like Christianity or Buddhism or something like that. It might not be everyone's cup of tea, right? 
So people often say as a therapist, how do you use stoicism with your clients? Well, I can't take a client in therapy and just indoctrinate them into stoicism any more than I can indoctrinate them into Buddhism or Marxism or Islam or something like that, you know? They might not agree with its values. Um, they might find a conflict, to be in conflict with their, their existing values, for example. So therapists have to be neutral. Um, and, and, you know, that, would, that conflicts with therapist neutrality in a sense because stoicism does have a set of fundamental moral values. Now, what actually happens often is the clients come into therapy and say, I'm into stoicism and I heard you wrote a book about it. Could we talk about it? In which case, it's, you know, it's a little bit more of a gray area. It's more legitimate. We can say, okay, it came from the client. But the very thing that makes stoicism problematic as a remedy, as a therapy, is potentially its biggest strength in terms of a res becoming a resilience building approach. Because people, stoicism isn't just for Christmas. Like yoga, Buddhism, you know, these kind of big ideologies, philosophies of life, people who get into stoicism tend to stay into stoicism. You know, the way I like to put it is people get it tattooed on them, you know, like people get Marcus Aurelius tattoos and stuff. They're serious about it. It's not a technique. It's a philosophy of life. And so it's lasting and potentially permanent in many cases. And that aspect of it is what makes it particularly intriguing in terms of resilience building. Now, it still would be problematic because there might be people who say, well, look, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Christian or whatever, and I'm not entirely sure if, if Stoicism is consistent with some other values. Um, but nevertheless, for the people who would be open to it, it may offer a lasting, permanent, long-term form of resilience because it's a whole philosophy of life. You know, it's not some techniques. You'd have to keep doing a, a refresher course. And, and, and part of that is not just the fact it's a set of values and a philosophy of life, but another aspect of that is the literature. What's different between Stoicism and CBT is that the Stoic uh, literature consists of classics. It's beautifully and memorably written. So no one that I'm aware of, I'm yet to be uh, disproven on this hypothesis, but you know, I, I keep an open mind. It may be possible, but so far today, I've yet to discover a single living human being with an Albert Ellis tattoo. Right? Not one so far. But loads of people I keep seeing on the internet get stoic quotes and uh, symbols and things tattooed on them. So nobody buys into CBT in that kind of way because it's not beautiful. Like, and the beauty of stoicism, in a way, is a quirk, um, because we have less than 1% of the stoic writing surviving today. Um, the reason that we have Seneca and Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus and Cicero, who's a, a, an academic, but one of our main sources, is because they were some of the finest writers of antiquity. And so it's kind of been curated for us for 2,000 years. And what we get are the most memorable, profound bits of Stoic writing. And, uh, you know, and the Stoics ha happens to be really into formulating sound bites. Seneca was criticized for it um, by other authors. Um, but that makes them very relevant today because the things that they say not only have rhetorical power, ironically, for philosophers, for Stoics, but they, they're often very pithy uh, and memorable sayings, like that quote from Epictetus. So in addition to it being big philosophy, um, a whole kind of worldview, the stuff that people are reading, like no one reads, uh, what's his name, David Burns' Feeling Good, like one of the CBT classics for depression. No one reads that every year. No one says, I go back and I read that book every year. It's like a Bible to me. Because like, it's a good book, but it's not, it's not a classic, it's not a work of art, but people read the meditations over and over and over and over again throughout their lives, they keep going back to it, like it's scripture, because it's so beautifully written and, and so profound. It's kind of interesting, because I had uh, a military scholar suggest to me that we, we have a chaplain corps that tends to religious needs of various different soldiers, but we don't have one for like atheism. And the question is, could you add like uh, a certain group of philosophers 
that if you weren't Christian and that was your source of resilience on the battlefield, could you have a Stoic philosopher available to you that could teach you Stoicism or, you know, a couple other useful philosophies and be there inside the military units for them? I mean, that's an idea I've kind of heard people touching on before as well. It's like, could you have a kind of Stoic chaplain? And uh, maybe, I, I mean, that might, might, maybe that would be something that would work. I'm not, I'm still kind of unsure about that. I guess we haven't really seen it in practice. And I suppose one of the difficulties that people mention as well is there are multiple ancient Greek philosophies. So as soon as someone suggests that, in my experience, or something like that, then you'll usually get someone else immediately going, what about an Epicurean chaplain? Like, don't we need a, Pl a Platonist and an Aristotelian chaplain as well? Or do we have one guy that's kind of doing a bit of everything? Like, and then it starts to kind of stall as an idea, I think. But it, on the other hand, I still feel there's some kind of currency to this this idea. I've just, you know, I think we just need to figure out a way to make something like that work. Um, but, you know, the stoicism continues to grow and grow in popularity. So I think we're, we're gradually finding more ways to make it accessible to people through online courses and things like that. And there's a real plethora of books coming out at the moment um, about stoicism from a self-help perspective. There were hardly any of those like 20 years ago. Um, and now there's, you know, oh, and also online, suddenly there are loads of articles about stoicism as a form of self-help. So there are, we're kind of gradually evolving ways to present it to people. Um, I think there's, there's more that we could do in that respect. I, I feel like there's a few things that still just need to kind of, kind of come into play. Um, but I don't see any sign that the popularity of stoicism is going to abate either. I think it's going to keep growing. The number of people who I find, and you've maybe found this too, there are a lot of people who have read Marcus Aurelius and don't even really kind of realize that he was a stoic or or that he was part of this bigger philosophical tradition um you know there are so there are loads of people into stoicism now but there are many 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 more people who have just read marcus aurelius who if you like are kind of potential stoics like they just haven't tapped into the wider tradition yet so there's a lot of room for growth as it were let me ask you a personal question so you talked about how you have the scholarship on behavioral therapy and then you have the connections back to the ancient philosophy. So through your course of career, like at what point, because obviously you kind of left the field to work more on the field of stoicism, at what point were you introduced to stoicism? Was it always there or was it something you stumbled upon? Well, let me see. It, how did I get into stoicism? I was always into philosophy um, oh, from when I was like 15 or something like that, um, I kind of, I guess I started off, first of all, kind of being into, interested in religion. Um, I was interested in lots of different types of religion, particularly interested in, in Gnostic uh, Christianity. And that kind of got me into Greek philosophy. And, you know, just over time developed more and more of an interest in, in Western philosophy as a whole. Then I studied philosophy at university. That was what my first degree was in. And so I was always, right from the outset, kind of trying to figure out how to reconcile my interests. Uh, I practiced Buddhist meditation and lots of other kind of, I did self-hypnosis and lots of other kind of psychological self-help techniques that I was really into. And uh, I decided I wanted to be a counselor and a psychotherapist. I was very interested in Jung and Freud and those guys. Um, and so I kind of, I guess when I finished my philosophy degree, I suddenly thought, how can I somehow combine all these things together? And for a couple of years, I struggled. I, I, I did my master's degree at an interdisciplinary center in Sheffield University uh, in the Faculty of Psychiatry at the Center for Psychotherapeutic Studies. And my, my master's dissertation was on existential uh, psychotherapy. Um, and I thought maybe existentialism is the way to kind of somehow combine philosophy and psychotherapy. And, and then I, that just didn't really seem to work for me. And round about that same time, I was getting more into CBT. And I the interest in Gnosticism had led me into Neoplatonism. And I read Pierre Hadot's book, The Simplicity of Vision, which is about Plotinus and about Neoplatonism. And... Uh, I read, then I thought, this is a great book. 
Um, it's not really answering this question for me, but I'm really interested in it. The stuff that it's not all quite coming together. Then I read Hiddo's other books, and I realised he said a lot more in them about Stoicism, and I immediately recognised that Stoicism basically was a, an ancient form of psychotherapy. And I increasingly became it became very obvious to me how similar Stoicism was to REBT, uh, Rational Limited Behaviour Therapy. So I became more and more interested in cognitive therapy. And in parallel to that, early on in my career as a psychotherapist, uh, I became more and more interested in the parallels between REBT and or CBT in general and Stoicism. And that's kind of how I get into it. And then I give talks about it, and you know, at conferences. Um, I, I often go, well, I'll, I'll talk about this kind of weird, quirky, niche thing that I'm kind of into. And then and then people were interested in it. And I wrote some articles about it. And I thought, this is odd. And then I wrote a book about it um, called The Philosophy of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Um, I was kind of asked by a psychotherapy publishing house in the UK to write that book. And I really just wanted to kind of like a lot of people in the writing, something like that, I just want, I really approached it as an attempt to just get it straight in my own head. So I spent a lot of time surrounded. I went away and stayed and caught a cottage in the countryside. I went to a Catholic retreat center as well. And I remember just being surrounded by sheets of paper and books on the floor, like, you know, shut myself away, trying to kind of make sense out of all this stuff and pull the stuff I was reading in Hado, um, who Hado did a superb job of reviewing classical philosophy in general, mainly Hellenistic philosophy, uh, and mainly Stoicism, but also Platonism, Epicureanism as well, and looking for what he called spiritual exercises. So he thought of these as similar to Christian contemplative practices. And that struck me as so bizarre in a way, because I thought he's done a superb job of this, but why has... I, I kind of understand why, but I, I, he's come so close to just saying, oh, yeah, these are obviously resemble psychotherapy techniques yeah. that we use in modern psychotherapy. But he just never kind of made that, uh, drew that analogy, but he compiled them, listed them all, and provided the evidence from the primary sources. And so I kind of reviewed that, compared it to stuff in modern psychotherapy as thoroughly as I could, and then maybe added a couple that like, I, I thought you know, it were easier for me to spot from the perspective of modern psychotherapy. I'd be like, oh, this thing looks like a description of something that we do today. And uh, and so I wrote that book about it, and I thought, mm, I didn't think that much more of it, because I thought, well, I just wanted to straighten this out myself. And then gradually, more and more people started to ask me about it. And Chris Gill was doing something similar at Exeter University, and, you know, he really brought this team of people together, um, we run Stoic Week every year, like, which is an online course that allows people to kind of experiment with Stoic concepts and exercises. Um, 7,000 people did Stoic Week last year, and five years ago or so, in its first year, 700 people did it. So in the space of five years, it's grown to 10 times its original size. And then, uh, you know, like that speaks to the fact that we sat around and went, oh, Maybe there's something in this. We put it online, 700 people did it. And then it just grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. And I think part of it is the internet. The, there are these people, I think I call um, like a stoic diaspora. You know, there are stoics scattered all over the world. And they didn't, they didn't talk to other people about stoicism or kind of know that other people had this strange interest. And then they go online and suddenly they are talking to each other. And the internet has allowed us to kind of bring these people together to form a community for the first time. And that, I think, has really driven things forward. Online education in general is just quite remarkable. It's like the fact that you could watch a YouTube channel and get information yeah. on it. You're no longer trapped to saying, hey, if I want to know about more about stoicism, I have to find a college and find ways to pay for tuition. It's just available there and simplified and well, I know you run several communities on Facebook that you could go in there and say, hey, I have an honest question. You have people that are willing to help you find the right answers. And, and then there's this thing called the, the Stoic Fellowship as well, where they, people have meetup groups for Stoics in cities all over the world. Oh, I have to look into that one. 
yeah, there's lots of things uh, like that happening. But yeah, I still feel psychotherapists, funnily, they, there's always these kind of paradoxes. I, I still think psychotherapists aren't as on board as they could be like with stoicism. Like they're, they're kind of like a, a lagging behind a little bit. They always seem a little bit surprised when they find out about it as well. Like, like oh, there's loads of people that are into this thing. And, and yeah, like we talk about it a bit, but we didn't realize it was such a big thing. So they're, they're kind of, I feel like they're, they've, they've fallen behind the, the growth of interest. I got a message actually uh, from uh, a, a very well-known uh, UK psychotherapist a couple of days ago uh, who got in touch with me about this and uh, was kind of interested in, in the stuff that was going on in stoicism. So I honestly, I kind of, I really do have the sense that psychotherapy as a profession is just kind of catching up with the fact that there's been this huge resurgence of, of interest in it. And the, the REBT people are really interested in it because they, like REBT is a lot of a dated therapy or it's perceived in that way now. Um, so it fascinates them that there's this huge resurgence in a philosophy that's, you know, seems to lend credibility uh, and, and give a boost to their uh, approach. So we often have REBT practitioners uh, speaking at the, the Stoicon conference. You seem to be a man of infinite wisdom and, and information on Stoicism. Um, for the my audience members that want to find out more information or get involved, how can they get in contact with you or the community? Well, that's easy in a way, because like I say, Modern Stoicism, which I should say is a non-profit limited company is run by a team of volunteers. Um, and its website is just modernstoicism.com. If you go there, um, I'll briefly do a plug for it because it's a philanthropic thing. It, it's uh, Chris Gill is the chair of the team. And then there's like a maybe about six, seven, eight other people and the, the makeup of the team kind of changes a little bit over time so people come and go. But um, so there's several people that, uh, involved with it that you'll be familiar with who are uh, writers, uh, uh, academics related to stoicism, things that they do. They, Greg Sadler, uh, who runs a very popular YouTube channel for philosophy, edits the blog called Stoicism Today, which has over 500 articles in it. And anyone can submit an article to that. And if you look in there, there are people, as I said earlier, we have these kind of subgroups. There are people from all walks of life talking about how they make use of Stoicism. So it's that gives them a way that they can publish their articles. And, and now, it, because it's so big, anytime anyone says, Donald, do you, do you know any articles about stoicism in parenting? Or do you know any articles about stoicism in autism? Or do you know any articles about stoicism in, in, in surgery or anything like that? You know, I'll say just go on modern stoicism and search for the keyword, and you'll probably find two or three articles have already been written by people about whatever subject it is that you're interested in. So the, we do that. There's a Stoicon conference that runs every year. It was in Toronto last year. And this year, John Sellers is organizing it. It's going to be back in London again. Uh, we have it in different countries and different cities each year. Last year, 400 people attended. Um, we have Stoicon X, kind of smaller spin-off conferences every year that happen in different cities around the world. We have the Stoic Week online course, which I mentioned already, and that runs every year. Anyone can do it. It's international. It's free of charge. It runs for seven days. It's an online course, and it allows you to do a different Stoic practice and explore different Stoic techniques each day. It's just like a taster. But because we did that, we also developed a thing called the Stoic Attitudes and Behaviors Scale, which is uh, a questionnaire that's gone through various uh, versions, revisions. And so we Tim Lebon, who's an author that writes about philosophy and therapy. He's a CBT practitioner in the NHS. And Tim collates and writes reports on our statistics. So we gather data on the demographics um, and on these questionnaire outcomes and also on the efficacy of Stoic practices. So because we were doing that with, with Stoic Week, we thought this isn't a proper controlled study. And so we decided we needed to develop something that was progressively getting closer towards that. Now, we're still doing pilot studies effectively, but we developed a thing called Stoic Mindfulness and Resilience Training, which is a four-week long, much more carefully controlled uh, protocol. And uh, 
we've run that a few times. We have data from that as well. And so we the, the, the data from the pilot studies consistently show improvements in established, validated measures of um, life satisfaction, positive and negative emotions, um, the same scales that are used in mainstream research on CBT and positive psychology, so we can compare our results. So we haven't yet done a, like a, a randomized controlled trial. Um, so we haven't got we haven't done it yet with control group, which is going to be tricky. But we've done several online studies where we gathered data, outcome data from people uh, using stoicism as a kind of attempt just to get our materials together and stuff. So hopefully one day we'll be able to do some RCTs and stuff. But we have this course also that anyone can do, which is four weeks long, and it's much more focused on core psychological skills that are relevant to Stoicism. It's called SMRT, or Stoic Mindfulness and Resilience Training. So those are the main things modern Stoicism does. And if anybody wants to have a look at my website, it's just called donaldrobertson.name. And that's got my blog on it. It's got lots of articles in Stoicism. And I have online courses. Most of them are free. I also have courses in Socrates, Marcus Aurelius, um, that I run every year. I, there are much more kind of detailed courses. And uh, and there you'll find out about my books and articles and stuff there. I've just written a book, I should say, called How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, The Stoic Philosophy of Marcus Aurelius. So I'm doing lots of kind of background work on promoting that and kind of final edits to it and stuff like that at the moment. But that that book is very much about Marcus Aurelius's life and how that kind of intersects, anecdotes about his life kind of intersect with his philosophy and can teach us things about coping with anger and sadness and pain and illness and anxiety today. So it's a self-help book, but very much tied up with anecdotes about, uh, about Marcus Aurelius's life. I wanted to write something that maybe gave people a deeper appreciation of the meditations by introducing them to a lot of material that they might not already be familiar with. Well, thank you. Um, is there anything else that you'd want to say more specific to the military community or resources for specifically them? That relates to military stuff. I don't really know. I mean, I would say the main thing I, I feel is to look at James Stockdale uh, his writings and, you know, Thoughts of a Philosophical Fighter Pilot is a good collection of his articles. And just in terms of, I don't know if it's the, the kind of most, the broadest introduction, it's not the, the best of introduction to Stoicism, except in, as an overview of the philosophy, but in terms of kind of inspiration uh, and giving people an idea how relevant Stoicism can be uh, to guys in the military, then I, I think Stockdale is a really good place to start. I'd like to recommend Nancy Sherman's book, but I feel that she kind of veers a lot. I don't know if I agree with her interpretation of Stoicism. She, as we, you start off by comparing it to lowercase Stoicism, and I feel that, you know, her writings are very interesting, but sometimes she kind of seems to blur the distinction between good Stoicism and bad Stoicism, as it were. Um, I think there should be a kind of sharper distinction between these things. But uh, also, um, Thomas Jarrett's Warrior Resilience Training, I think, is something that is worth looking at as well. Yeah, he has an exceptional video online called Stoicism and Warrior Resilience Training for, on YouTube that definitely is worthwhile while. Yeah. yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, I thank you. I deeply appreciate your time and talking about the subject that maybe a lot of our soldiers in their junior in their career don't get an opportunity to engage with so I, I do thank you well thanks very much for inviting me to to uh, come along and uh, be here and chat to you about my favorite subject today <laughs> <laughs> okay well thank you audience uh until next time focus on your self-development so we can ensure we can dominate the modern battle